Welcome to Hell of Presidents. This is Bonus 5. Uh, we're going to be talking about elections today. U.S. presidential elections. How we pick the big man. If you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. Repeat after me. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter. I, Barack Hussein Obama. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly, solemnly swear. swear. We wanted to do this as our fifth bonus episode because elections, I mean, they serve a dual purpose. It's both the actual political process through which we select new leaders and invest them with political power, but it has the spiritual purpose of granting legitimacy to the whole project. You know, for most Americans, at least the ones who vote, especially since we lack the more participatory party systems of like Europe or elsewhere, um, you know, voting is the one time you basically offer consent to the state in a physical and symbolic act. So that's why we kind of wanted to hone in on this for this episode. Yes, the, the act of voting is the consecration of the democratic system. Uh, and it's also over time becomes uh, a civic ritual, not just in terms of uh, a consecration, a ritual in terms of a festival, a carnival, yes. a, a, a fun time for the whole family. <laughs> and honestly, the extended length of campaigns as time goes on uh, is in part a function of their increased entertainment value. Yeah. I mean, after, after a while, it's hard to imagine America reducing our electoral seasons like they do in Europe, for example, where you'll call a, an election for two months from now. Uh, and it's because too much of our actual like culture is built around the observation of elections. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, because, and I think a lot of that is because at the end of the day, going into a room once every th two or four years and pressing a button is just not enough considering uh, the reality of living in America. And so we have to add all of this spectation to it that serves as a further affirmation of the democratic process. Do you think that that is at least partially due to the uh, the kind of weird longevity of the American democratic process? I mean, we are at this point the longest continually functioning, you know, democratic country, or, or at least in that in the, in the way that our system is basically maintained for this long. Do you think that any system would tend towards heightening that kind of investment in the elections over time? Yes, because there's so little other places to participate. Mm -hmm. Like like we've said, America's Americans, um, the United States has a uniquely weak party system. Our political parties, even though they dominate the electoral process and squat on the crucial ballot lines that determine the contours of American democracy, they are structurally very weak and they mm -hmm. have no real mass participation right. the way that you have in other countries. Uh, and that is – uh, a function of the fact that, yes, we have the oldest constitution currently uh, operating, and it was founded and structured by people who did not assume a role for political parties in the process. In fact, mm -hmm. assumed that their system could only work without the formation of parties uh, because at that point there was this fusion between the ruling class and the political class. The people who were going to vote – hold office, and hold capital. We're all the same guys. So there was a thought that political parties would be not be necessary because there'd be no real material conflicts within this group, that they would all basically want the same thing. That they were essentially de facto all in one political party. Exactly. The party of capital, of land, mm -hmm. the, 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 the wealthy, the, the good citizens, the, the, uh, the quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, we ended up uh, creating two different poles of political economy in the United States over the colonial period, a, 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 a agrarian slave-based society in the South mm -hmm. and a free labor eventually as slavery kind of withered away in places where it was not geographically suited north of the Mason-Dixon, uh, replaced with a free economy around uh, increasingly industry. Uh, and that creates two competing uh, agendas, right. and that necessitates 
parties, factions, as they call them, to emerge to represent those agendas. And so you have this early stage of the Republic where there are parties, but they are still relatively nascent, and there isn't much of an electorate outside of the political class, and that is when you see the Virginia dynasty dominating. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it breaks up under John Quincy Adams into the, the, the second party system uh, with the emergence of this new class, this new self-conscious political class of people not within the highest ranks of the ruling elite, people from the middle strata of, of America who seek political uh, office uh, as a way for social advancement uh, and also the assertion of the power of themselves and their interests. Uh, and that creates the the real emergence of the party system. Uh, and it's the product of up-jumped New Yorkers, really, as mm-hmm. New York's uh, commercial economy eclipsed the Virginia economy, which had been the largest economy among the colonies at the beginning of the, the country. Uh, M- Martin Van Buren. Uh, and then his opposite number, not spoken of as, as much, but in a similar and crucial position, Thurlow Weed. Thurlow Weed. We love Thurlow Weed. Don't From we the folks? anti-Masons to the Whigs to the Republicans, Weed represents the attempt by the Northern uh, commercial economy to create an actual political party around its interests. So, so I want to hone in on something that you're saying there, because I think it helps make sense of these things. It's like you're talking about the collapse of the Virginia dynasty as this de facto ruling coalition. I think that's one of the things that, based on the stuff that I've written for later that we're going to hone in on, is that you can look at the party system and the development of it, and not as much as the advancement of one thing, but the collapse of another thing. Exactly, yeah. Um, there has to be a hole for things to fill, because otherwise right, right. the two part, the two lines, the first past the post, will push out any uh, any other energy. So, I mean, I think it's you know important to hone in that both these impulses, the weeds, you know, eventual Republican impulse and and Van Buren's Democrat ones, do come from New York, because you know I I think what you're you're, you're getting at there is as the South becomes what it becomes in the antebellum period. It's, it's stagnant. It's, it's ruling yeah. elite is generational because exactly. they're inheriting the land. leadership has to come from outside. Yeah. So the new party systems are being generated in these places where there's an influx of capital, where it's generating literally a exactly. new elite over time. And that's where these new mechanisms of parties start yes. growing up to fill the needs of these new elites. And they represent two poles of interest. The northern interest uh, embodied for the longest period of this time by the Whigs uh, is for development, internal development of the, the United States commercial economy and its industrial base. Uh, and in the South, it, for the uh, the Southern Party that Van Buren founded, but was headquartered in the commercial sectors of New York connected to the plantation economy, right. it was expansion, mm-hmm. getting much as much more land as possible, as quickly as possible, paying um, keeping the federal state, which threatened Southern prerogatives weak uh, and uh, making up for the lack of any built structure by the internal infusion of money from selling lands in the West where slavery could expand. Uh, and that conflict, absent any real com- uh, influence from the common people, the electorate, mm-hmm. because at this point you have a relatively sparse electorate that only grows uh, over time during this period. At the, right. at, when the Civil War started, South Carolina was still using uh, n- no popular vote mechanism to elect to uh, elect its uh, presidential slate. Mm-hmm. Like they were still directly uh, uh, selecting it from like the state legislature in South yeah. Carolina. Exactly, the state legislature was doing it without any insight from the without any input from the voters, and that and and so participation varies from state to state. But there are these huge geographic, cultural, and ethnic differences between the common people that prevents them even when they do participate in the electoral system, from doing much other than ratify these two cases. A part of this is because the elections at this point are wildly crooked. Yes. Uh, There's no way that you can refer to any of the elections of this period as truly the will of the people. Forgetting the lack of representation for women or blacks or Indians, you have the simple fact that the the votes themselves were largely manipulated. You had – because the participation that the workers, the common people of the cities at least, had within this system was as members of nascent political machines. And Mm -hmm. these machines operated to manufacture votes. To generate the vote that the machine sought. Exactly. There was a process called cooping, Mm -hmm. which was common in the antebellum American cities where gangs of locally – local Democrats or Whigs or whoever would get trunks off the street – 
take them from polling place to polling place, change their outfits, give them a shave, and have them vote multiple times. It, it's it's actually theorized that Edgar Allan Poe was Edgar Allan Poe was. I killed. was just going to bring this up in a in a cooping <laughs> fraud in, in a rough cooping. <laughs> yes, that's the theory. Uh, yes. So this is two political structures around two economic interests, essentially dictating the terms of debate. And that is what we get really during this period before the Civil War. Uh, But eventually, the centrality of slavery to politics, something that both parties, Whigs and Democrats had suppressed, erupts and you have this Republican Party. But it can only fill that space left by the collapse of the Whigs. Right. To what extent could we call the Republican electoral movement like a populist movement as much as just a realignment of the professional class of of politicians? So the Republican Party, and then finally culminating in the Lincoln campaign, uh, is the first populist expression of northern sentiment among mm-hmm. among the uh, yeoman and uh, mechanics of the north. By the way, we've said mechanics a million times in this and we've never defined the term. That's basically the 19th century term for work like working like laborers, like urban Anybody laborers. Anybody who works with their hand, they call them a mechanic, yeah. Uh, so they had no real representation. The, the the common class north and south was dominated by the Democratic Party and their mm-hmm. Uh, imperatives, which were really the imperatives of southern uh, southern slave capital. So the Demo- the northern uh, commoner was really at the mercy of this dynamic. They could vote for the Whigs, but the Whigs were the party of the business interests that they right. saw as antithetical to theirs. So they were essentially along for the ride. But as slavery becomes more prominent as a question, as the question of are we going to be a slave or free country becomes more prominent, and as they become more threatened by the prospect of slavery encroaching on their ability to assert themselves as independent free men becomes more salient, uh, their ability to uh, put up with the South basically it goes away. And that destroys the premise of both parties. Uh, and the Republicans emerge to capture that sentiment. And they are the first party to really represent common Northern opinion that isn't hostage to the South. Uh, and they very quickly become an electoral dominant force uh, that upturns the old system and shows to the planter class that in the in even the narrow term, their uh, days are numbered. And right. And and because the constitutional order is not built to withstand these kind of issues, because there is no place in it for party politics or factions, it, it, it blows up. And it honestly should have been destroyed then, as we have said many times. But the thing to point out is that this system that's now being built and then rebuilt after the Civil War of parties is filling in the cracks of mm-hmm. the constitutional order. It is uh, essentially a growth. It's a fungus on the constitutional <laughs> governance. Uh, and as such, it operates – with independent uh, momentum and and uh, and its own rules that have that are only kind of uh, orthogonally related to uh, the the structure of constitutional order as the, as we imagine we live in it. It is funny to think of you know maybe one kind of crackpot way that you can look at American history is the slow subversion of constitutional order into party order. Yeah. Even though the parties themselves are hollowed out of any real authority or so, or awareness of like ideological vectors, like they're purely eventually become just boxes of influence, mm-hmm. collections of money flow. They're just channels for cash. So maybe this is a good place to put this question that I, I almost wanted to wedge in up top. But, you know, one of the things that I feel like we've mentioned offhandedly and I've, I've seen it, at least one person ask about is, you know, we say we in America, we don't have participatory parties. And I just wanted to like maybe hone in on that and the difference between the way of America's parties work as opposed to, let's say, like the classic old labor parties of Western Europe. And I, you know, in the sense that it is not participatory, you don't pay dues to the party. You don't go yeah. to, uh, you know, weekly party meetings to, you know, learn about how the party or learn and affect the way that the party functions from the ground up. It is not a democratic institution in and of itself. At least that's my understanding of the the central. And and eventually that changed with the introduction of caucuses and primaries. But because they are direct votes, as opposed to like the way that the Labor Party selects their leadership through internal member votes, Mm -hmm. uh, it means that that just becomes a way for money to go around the party system and directly appeal to voters. Mm -hmm. And that therefore destroys the ideological coherence of the parties. Uh, They end up just being uh, coats of paint for different flows of capital (laughs) because you're, if you're a regular person, if you're a voter, you are not going, you are only showing up every four years or two years and pressing a button based on stuff you saw in the media which Mm -hmm. is determined by money flows. It's not determined by any kind of uh, party project. Uh, And 
But before that, before we even brought in the money, when we had parties that determined their own candidates, uh, there was still relatively little democracy from below because these choices were not made by a mass elect, uh, a mass membership. They were made by the people uh, who made up the actual elector electoral class, right? The members of Congress, the the, the state legislators, their merchants or landowning mostly, friends, mostly pulled from the noblesse oblige, the <clears throat> mostly pulled from the noblesse obliged ruling class, <laughs> uh, and the up jumped and uh, self starting middle class. Not a lot of representation from the commons there. Uh, And that is why you have this party that even at its bottom is represented by the proto uh, civil bureaucracy of America's cities and at the top entirely by concentrations of money. But the Republicans are able to erupt here as a populist force, which for the first time brings populist energy to parties, as we talked about with Matt Carp, the wide awakes. Right. This is the first creation of participation in, in a democratic process that is beyond going to watch uh, the big ball of tin uh, roll down the hill to to signal in the, the, the rush of mighty waters of uh, Tippecanoe and Tyler too, uh, or to you know be a member of some like a uh, uh, Tammany gang that hits drunks in the head and makes them vote ten times. Right. This is like actual uh, civic participation, which then culminates in the mass political participation of the creation of the Union Army, mm-hmm. which is a citizen military that commit that carries out the political act. Yeah, of suppressing a rebellion. And we saw that even talking about like all those Ohio handsome generals who joined up. Almost every one of their stories involves a at least some kind of spiritual moment of feeling like I not only owed the I owe this to not just the country but the Republicans, the union yes. that these are the people yes. who represent me and yep. I owe myself my life to yep. them. Uh, people often say that uh, that the Battle of Atlanta is really the last chance that the Confederacy had to win the war because if McClellan, the peace candidate Democrat, had won in '64, that the uh, they would have maybe carried out a negotiated settlement with the Confederacy and, and acknowledged its existence. Uh, but that forgets the fact that Lincoln's margins in '64 were overwhelmingly among the military, the guys right. who were actually out there risking shitting to death in a field or getting shot with a slow moving piece of lead <laughs> through the thigh, meaning and any contact with your skin means you're losing a limb. Yep. They voted overwhelmingly for Lincoln and not their favorite former commander who they loved because he didn't get them killed. McClellan. Right. So we, talk, we politi- went into this with Matt, with Carl. Yeah. yeah. So like this is the culmination of the political process of the, constitutional order, the creation of this thing riven with contradictions, whose contradictions are undone over time by the growth of the country, geographically and population size, and the development of conflict socially within its groupings that then erupts in violence that can no longer be contained within the bounds of regular politics. And in that moment, we have all of these protean forces emerge and the possibility of things like a multi-racial American uh, common, like land seeking and, and, and uh, laboring class in opposition to a a, uh, a dominant ruling capital ownership class. Uh, and parts of it are brought into being temporarily, but eventually, a thanks to things like the ascension of Andrew Johnson as president, uh, one of those moments when who is president matters to a catastrophically massive degree. Right. Uh, eventually, you get the dissipation of all that popular energy, the resumption of, of – uh, the antebellum political process, the resumption of the academic antebellum political structure of the constitution, which truly was suspended for the course of the war right. uh, is now reasserted to catastrophic result. Uh, and it is because of the balance of forces, the creation of the, the end of the civil war created a, for the first time unified ruling class in the United States, mm-hmm. there was no longer fighting itself between Charleston and uh, Boston was now headquartered in Washington. That had been built by the creation of this massive state, this new bureaucratic behemoth that was able to carry out this insanely huge undertaking of destroying a rebellion when previously they hadn't even been able to drain a puddle of shit 100 yards <laughs> behind the White House. <laughs> yes. And at the top, you have you know, unity new now amongst this ruling class, uh, people who largely made huge capital concentrations outfitting the military during this war. But on the south, on the bottom of the of the poll uh, among the common class, you have massive separation. The Northerners 
hate the Southerners now because they just spent four years killing each other. The newly freed slaves are hated by all segments of white society in the South for threatening their social order in a time of economic decline. This is the crucial thing is that there is this gold standard uh, strangulation put on the growth of the United States Mm -hmm. uh, and, and its ability to intervene in its economy by this new ruling class, which means you have a dispirited and violently culturally alienated common class, which hasn't even really built itself into a, a working class yet. So that means that the period after the Civil War is dominated by, by two parties that are completely controlled by the top, who are only at the bottom are connected to the working class through machines like Tammany Hall that exist to uh, bring together the, the, the most ambitious of the workers with the uh, money of the rulers, essentially, to allow the party to function. Uh, and it operates a political contest that is defined mostly by a politics of geographic identity. Vote the way you shoot. Yes. And that allows a politics to operate that is just the pure id of this new ruling robber baron class. The unorganized desires of a bunch of competing psychopathic uh, <laughs> capitalists who use the two parties to basically have a knife fight over with each other over the corpse of an America that they are in the process of completely feasting upon. I mean, I mean, I think it's, I mean, <laughs> that's all like the, the expression at the top. This is a little tangential to it, but I think it's interesting that just as we saw, you know, the, um, the wide awakes in the fifties is like the populist expression of, of the party from the top in the, in the Republicans at the same time in the South, you were seeing like the, clan and the red shirts right yes the redeemers yes generating themselves as like the on the ground paris para not parasocial god paramilitary <laughs> <laughs> well perhaps they did have a parasocial relationship with you know whatever uh you know southern lawyer congressman they thought that who their will was representing but yeah these armies being organized on behalf of the democratic party in the yes. south to to reify the rule through violence and bloodshed yes. On the ground. Because, as I said, the war opens up this Pandora's box of possibilities. And what is settled on, what is settled on is the abolition of slavery. The South is proves, proves that it does not have the capacity to resist the abolition of slavery and the creation of a free, quote unquote, labor republic. Mm-hmm. But it has much, it definitely has sufficient uh, capacity and will to resist the imposition of a an, non-racial social order right that they are able to resist now the north could have resisted them back and if we see as we saw from the result of the civil war if push comes to shove the north has the advantage but it also has to have the political will right which over the course of the late 1800s dissipates especially as the panic of 1873 uh brings everyone to a point of uh, immiseration as the capitalists bestride the country, create new massive concentrations of capital, new industrial capacity, and a huge new force of industrial laborers. Uh, And also in the countryside, the yeomen are seeing their independence and ability to fulfill their Jeffersonian dream destroyed by the encroachment of banks and railroads on their land and the continued deflationary impact of the gold standard. And I know know that the Panic of 73 doesn't quite fit this mold because it's in this point of total Republican domination for the latter part of the 19th century. But that is another trend that, you know, you see with these these party switches is that these panics, these periodic collapses in the stability of capital often presage these collapses of of one party structure to another. Yeah, exactly. Because they're being carried along by this bubble, essentially, of economic growth and by the will of this particular formation of capital. Uh, which at this point uh, is able to dictate terms as it wants, create uh, a maximally exploitative structure to accumulate profits as quickly as possible. But because both parties are completely captured at the top here, all of the real class-based energy that is being um, emerging here, that all the alienation on, amongst the common voters, it cannot be captured by either party. 
Mm -hmm. They are as incapable of capturing anti-capitalist sentiment as the antebellum parties were of capturing anti-slavery sentiment. Which is why both parties are obsessed with civil service reform at this time, because that's the only way they can manifest that expression of being like, well, we're not going to change anything, but maybe we can like clean up the functionaries who actually carry out everything. Yeah, well, there needed to be some sort of rebalancing of the influence of, of the of the uh there needed to be some sort of party rebalancing of the political process because it was leading towards catastrophic class conflict because this anti this working class uh, alienation it cannot be contained by the parliamentary system, which means it will eventually turn to violence. Mm-hmm. And it does turn to violence. We have very the most violent, violent um, uh, compared to our European cousins, we have by far the most violent labor organizing uh, history of the 19th and early 20th century. So you're seeing violence emerge uh, and – Eventually, you're seeing a political conflict, con- uh, a political formation emerge in the form of the Populist Party, uh, which mm. in 1896 merges essentially with the Democratic Party to nominate William Jennings Bryan, uh, and so terrifies the ruling class that they essentially, at one level, start to coordinate amongst themselves at, at, uh, as firms. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is actually for founded is founded in 1896. In order to support the McKinley campaign. Right. So you have this new coordination among the ruling class, which acknowledges, hey, maybe we have to cooperate a little bit more and compete less to maintain this system that is uh, advantaging us so much. Uh, and they that can, that moment is happening alongside a middle class political realization along the same lines, a realization that this machine is no longer stable. And so you see this new progressive movement, which is the urban educated middle classes and the noblesse obliged aristocrats like uh, Theodore Roosevelt seizing control of the political system and the parties Mm -hmm. uh, from the pure clutches of capital, uh, injecting uh, democratic accountability in the form of these self-conscious project oriented formations within the political parties. And these are the forces that push for civil service reform. And these are the, they start as the liberal Republicans challenging Grant's renomination. Right. Uh, and they eventually form into this uh, recognition, this new formation uh, that dominates the tops of both political parties because it is the consensus opinion among both political classes. Uh, and so they do one thing for capital, which is – Civil service reform, mm-hmm. which reduces the rabble's influence on the political parties. Uh, and in exchange, they coordinate a program of regulation right. with capital to facilitate economic stability. And that creates then the post-progressive consensus uh, after World War I, right. when the labor movement and its nascent Socialist Party and, and Communist Party formations are – repressed brutally in the in the first red scare uh and then there is this general post-war disciplining of capital uh which allows for this new consensus that includes regulation of the economy and, and things like the the uh things like the federal reserve mm-hmm. uh, and an income tax but which is otherwise wildly hands off with the uh economy which it becomes increasingly speculative as it must because it's hitting Hard uh, ecological boundaries, uh, but it is necessitating continued growth because capitalism is premised on that. But even still then, you know, because things are going well, you can see the complete dominance of, you know, the party that ostensibly represents this capital. Exactly. uh, And and it's all it's all borrowed. It's all on credit. But what it means is now you have a working class, their political expression beaten and and co-opted. Now, once again, regionally defined. Right. And and dispersed voting where they grandpa shot now yes, exactly. uh, and, and voting increasingly on cultural issues like women's suffrage and uh, prohibition. That solid South sure is solid. Yeah. And they have prohibition. a lot of memories down there. Yeah. And Catholicism. Yes. So but this this consensus is, of course, broken as they all end up being by an economic crisis mm-hmm. within the capitalism that emerges out of its contradictions. Right. And this one is really big. Now, we've had a bunch of really big ones before. 37 was really big. 73 was huge. 94 was huge. Mm -hmm. But the difference is this one, the Great Depression, occurs after the creation of an American working class. Right. There's a working class now that there really wasn't before. 
The mechanics have become laborers. They have become workers. They workers. they they consider themselves workers. Mm-hmm. They 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 no longer believe in the the producers' republic that their grandfathers did. That's been beaten out of them. And the the increase in the U.S. population, its urbanization, mm-hmm. and the creation of mass media and transportation technology means they are able to harness their physical abilities more effectively. They're able to organize and coordinate more effectively. So when this crisis happens, there is a mass disillusioning with the political system, a mass radicalization of workers, and a willingness to fight with capital in a way they hadn't been before in the form of wave of strikes, wildcat strikes, sit-down strikes, uh, uh, battles with police, marches, protests, the joining in huge numbers of the Communist Party. Right. The creation of cadres within the Communist Party who become effective spear points of the labor movement as things like the the CIO. You have this new fully militant working class. Now, of course, it's still divided geographically and racially along those lines. There are fissures within it, but it has a self-awareness, which is then captured by FDR's Democratic Party. The structure that was there to be picked up took all of that electoral energy. It's like a hot air balloon inflating, like ready to be filled with that heat when the moment came. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, although American workers were unprecedentedly militant and organized and effective in their organization, they were still Americans. They had seen the benefits of as a regular person living in America, thanks to the free real estate. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) Free real estate. It has allowed for a glad hand, a, a, uh, a carrot to go with the stick of the authoritarian constitutional order. And that means that when FDR shows up and says, hey, let's try something different, they are willing to vote Democrat as opposed to fight a guerrilla war with the police or something. I mean, do you think that when we come to that 1932 moment and we, you're talking about, you know, a newly self-conscious working class. And again, I, the best comparison I have is, you know, my knowledge of and also just general uh, sim- historical similarities of Western Europe, you know. Uh, a lot more, a lot more uh, uh, willingness to to actively oppose the idea of the state yeah. uh, among the the labor laboring working classes of Western Europe. I mean, it, it, do you think that is just the part of having the 150 years of American history of having this again, this democratic ritual of yep. of seeing that you know we might have this new self consciousness of a, a radicalized working class party, but still the way that it has always worked here, the way that it continues to work is the way you express that is pulling the lever at the ballot box. Absolutely, because it has given them results. Right. It has given the American worker a a sense, not necessarily of momentary pleasure, or not in in a sense of necessarily being momentarily satisfied, but feeling that they have an opportunity to advance. Right. The American dream. And the American dream is every day reinscribed by the reality of living on a continent that can be parceled out Mm -hmm. the way that it was. Uh, And that has led to this faith in the American political structure that even though they might not have faith in what freedom used to mean to their grandfathers, they no longer have that phobia of the state because uh, they've seen the failure of of a hands-off approach up close and they want things to be better for them. Or if, as you've just outlined, the actual on the ground reality of the democratic processes of that state are you know wildly fraudulent at every point and and you know not necessarily returning the value to the the voters that they seem to that they might think they're putting yeah, into democracy it democracy machine broke basically yeah that's what happens when when the when the when there's a res- the depression like this uh it happens in the 1870s the response from capital through the or- through its organs of media and political party can be We can't intervene. Mm -hmm. That would be against our understanding of liberty and freedom and small government and constraint in the Constitution. It would be a violation of our American liberties to do this. And the people paying attention, urban newspaper reading liberals, would agree. Mm -hmm. The people who might disagree, the people being crushed under the wheel, are the least politically organized, the least effectively organized, the least involved, uh, and the least enfranchised. So they don't really have a say. But by the 30s, that changes. You have mass politics. You have the mass assertion of a collective experience of immiseration. And all of a sudden, the people for whom that idea of freedom never held can finally knock on the door and say, yeah, this is a bullshit idea of freedom. (laughs) And FDR is there to say, "Okay, let's get a new idea of freedom. 
And that is the explicit understanding of the New Deal. It, it was sold as a forge, reforging of an American social contract. Uh, and it was done through this experimental process whereby the progressive political class within the Democratic Party that had emerged out of the progressive era and still dominated its intellectual precincts, uh, allied with the political machine of the Democratic Party that still existed after the eras of patronage and mm-hmm. and machine politics had forged its construction, its actual architecture. Uh, those two forces co-op, uh, essentially do a uh, moment-by-moment ne- public negotiation with capital on what they will allow, basically, to be uh, incorporated into the public sphere that is outside of the realm of profit. And what we get is uh, the guarantee of uh, money for old people. We get a much more regulated financial economy because that's what had gotten us into this thing. We have, a uh, for the first time, a uh, agricultural subsidy program to uh, prevent a sudden immiseration among farmers. Right. And we have the recognition of the labor movement. We have the creation of the National Labor Relations Board, right. which brings labor to the table of industrial disputes instead of having the state instinctively side with capital in every labor dispute, which becomes just an impossible uh, roadblock to effective union organizing. Uh, and so you this this new social democracy is forged. This And it's dominated by this party, the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is essentially destroyed and brought along for the ride to represent <laughs> to represent the interests of capital of course but then socially like northern small bourgeois opinion that that's the popular uh that is the popular base for the republican party at this time and that's a lot of people and they are very politically important and elect in terms of the electoral college in terms of their uh, the amount of money that they put into politics and the uh the frequency with which they vote and are active in politics they're nothing to sneeze at, but compared to the working class and urban liberals, which is also a big, big chunk of people in these cities, that is an unbeatable economic or electoral dynamo. I'm, I'm just imagining a guy in the uh, 1937 driving around Manhattan in his Model A with a bumper sticker that says, I read the Wall Street Journal and I vote. Yeah, but but just as an aside here, you know, as we're trying to track the participatory elements of this, and you know, I, I'm kind of here interested in the the difference of our party structures at this point with this mass participation through organized labor and specifically unions at, at this one moment for like I don't know 30 years in the middle of the century, it's like the union structures take the place of like party organization, exactly. and the labor yes. uh, formation of the of the, the internal things. democracy that you would imagine in a mass party is done by the labor movement external to the party, but adjacent to it. Yes. Yes. Because you're voting. If you're a a member of the labor party in in the UK, you are voting in uh, elections, obviously for parliament, but you're also voting in party elections for representation. Right. Uh, And in the U S by and large during this period, you voted for, if you were a member of, if you were a worker, if you were a member of a union, you voted for the Democrats, and then you would vote for your union elections. And it's that union bureaucracy that carried out the organizing, the door knocking, uh, a lot of the, the the actual providing of funds, which is, right. of course, huge, because that means that there is competition for money within the Democratic Party between capital and labor, which had not existed previously. Exactly. Uh, and so this is a new model of America. And of course, like the... Uh, Republican explosion of the 1860s, it is pregnant with a bunch of uh, strands, a bunch of different possibilities, uh, some of which are uh, fulfilled and others which uh, die out. Uh, And during this period, you have a left within the Democratic coalition that is trying to, that is imagining itself as the spear point of a challenge with and overcoming of capitalism itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm talking about the radical heads of the Splinter uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations, but also a lot of those egg-headed progressives who made up the brain of the Democratic Party and a lo- large percentage of uh, – and, and a good percentage of its elected officials. They might have been liberals to the bone, but they were liberals who had seen capitalism fail uh, and, and, and saw 
a superior rationality in mm-hmm. socialism. And we're motivated by that sense. So this is a significant co- uh, coalition within the greater Democratic Party. But when FDR dies, when he does, mm-hmm. when his brain can no longer contain all of the contradictions of the party and project that he represents and his fucking his blood vessels explode, uh, he is replaced this guy who had embodied that entire project and I think was one of those guys who saw capitalism as something that needed to be suffocated. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a Keynesian's Keynesian and Keynes famously speaks about the euthanasia of the rentier class, <laughs> which is just a very fancy parlor talk for a a, a uh, reformist revolutionary overthrowing of capitalism. Right. The exact same thing, really, that revisionist Marxists in Germany were trying. The mm-hmm. Kautskyites and, and the SDP. Uh, I'm sorry, SPD. Uh, but FDR dies. We don't know how he would have managed that uh, coalition, but we know for sure that he was replaced by someone who represented the skeleton of the party structure itself. Right. A guy who was a uh, jumped up haberdasher from Independence, Missouri, who was plucked him from obscurity to become a judge and then a senator by a democratic political machine out of Kansas City, headed by a guy named Tom Pendergast. And we, we've talked at length about the, this crucial point of the swapping in of Truman for FDR. But, you know, as we're talking about elections here, it is, you know, part of it that I don't think we've explicitly talked about here is that, you know, one of FDR's great innovations and strengths is the forming of this unstoppable electoral coalition. And that one of the tragedies is, of his replacement is that it is done outside of elections. Yeah. That the coalition that FDR headed would most likely have never selected Harry Truman to take its place. He was selected by the party. Yes, exactly. That he is the remnant of this extra democratic process. The fact that we have so little democratic accountability is that something like this difference, like who gets to be on the ticket with the president who's old and dying, (laughs) is determined not by the actual electorate, but by its political class who are, of course, closer to capital than they are to the workers by definition. They're being pulled that way by the gravitational field of money uh, because the ones at the top are the ones who emerge, the ones who join the party in order to be political entrepreneurs, not because they're part of any class project. That kind of belief came from the quarters of the labor movement and those communist radicals in the CIO. And it's funny to the extent that even that we think now like, okay, well, our, our electoral system is so much more democratized now than it was in the in the 40s. And now we have this primary system and the most level of democratic participation that we have had in the history of our election. But even still, when it comes to putting in the person who might get in there if the president's head explodes, the person that we go with here in 2021 is the person who had to drop out of the primary before a vote was cast because they knew they were going to eat shit in front of the voters too much. And still in their own state, is, he was going to lose to Andrew Yang in California. In the, and still uh, Kamala Harris is the person who the party is allowed to come around outside of the uh, electoral process and put in there as the oldest person ever elected president is, is selected to serve. And it just shows that, you know, these things, they're still very much still with us. You know, he has, they, they, the, the Democratic Party strapped the, their electorate into their high chair and they took out and they said, you are going to take Lady Obama. You are going to eat your Lady Obama. OK, that we have this all figured out. We don't have anything to run on but identity now. We did really good with the black guy. Now it's like black lady. And that yeah. is your, that's what you do. I know you, you'll you'll eventually learn to like it because you won't have any alternative. Right. So because of this. This facet of American democracy, which comes from the fact that we are this very uh, – we are older than the rest of the democracies and we emerge mm-hmm. out of this colonial experiment uh, in expropriation that allows for uh, the kind of democratic structural uh, freedom that Europe couldn't afford. Mm-hmm. That They needed that uh, aristocracy to keep the cork on. In mm-hmm. America, that wasn't necessarily because social conflict could be resolved through expropriation. Right. So this, once again, free real estate, that's the function. You want to know why did we get Truman instead of uh, FDR? It's because we had a political system that was so antique that it had no place for political parties, which means political parties grew as this fungus, this this parasite on this political structure, which means that when you have this huge working class led political coalition looking to remake the globe in the aftermath of a catastrophic world war that reordered the global economy 
uh, the decision on who's going to be on the ticket with the guy who embodied this project for everybody in America democratically Mm -hmm. uh, comes down to party hacks in a room who tell FDR, a weakened FDR, that we will fight you on your nomination if you don't take Wallace, the Simon Pure liberal crypto communist who (laughs) had been his second vice president. And it was a fight they didn't think they could win, so they didn't make it. And there weren't enough people at the top who uh, were willing to push the point. And of course, they mostly resolved, hey, it probably won't matter anyway. And now, here in this moment, Truman helps preside over the decapitation of the labor movement. It's not just him, of course. Like there is a middle class, uh, remember those middle class Republicans? Well, the creation of this new order creates a huge backlash among them, and they become more polarized, more Republican, uh, and they are more threatened than ever by communism and the labor movement, and they also strike. Uh, And this double action from both parties to sort of decapitate the labor movement through Taft-Hartley, through the Red Scare, leads to this new moment where we have the same mass politics that have been created by the crisis, uh, but the drivetrain of class conflict has been pulled out of it, basically. Mm -hmm. And so what we now have is a moment, this is the moment when the working class as a political as a self-conscious political entity and as a force capable of representing itself in the political process, basically, uh, begins to dissolve. Right. Uh, we, the, the identity of the American worker sh- is begins to shift from worker. As we said, they started as th- thinking they were producers. Then they realized they were workers. And this is the moment when they will become imposed from above by this political system where they are unable to effectively engage at the highest levels as consumers. Right. And this period of massive economic growth where America as its in its position as global hegemon as the producer of the world and consumer of the world's produce, it creates it can it, it maintains that sense of upward mobility among the working class. Mm-hmm. The, they are they see their voting and their participation in the political process bearing real fruit. And so they keep voting for Democrats largely, yes, to build on these things. Now, of course, they make Eisenhower president because he's Ike. He fucking won the war. Right. Uh, but they are still a, they are still largely ratifying this social democratic concept, which is now being bu- now built on the super profits of empire. They're they're getting houses. They're getting consumer goods. Yep. You know, the quality of life is, is increasing. Yes. And what this means is that within the liberal Democrat, the liberal left sphere, the people who are who were pushing for communism mm-hmm. and are still pushing for some sort of continued advancement of America who recognize uh, with with pained morality, the the guilt of living in this world. They see basically the things that someone who is just pulling the next ladder to get up maybe doesn't notice mm-hmm. the racism, the right. injustice. They still have want a participation. They want a reason to participate in this political project. They still are necessary to the, the structure of the thing to, to participate in this political project. And they're doing so as members of the Democratic Party. And that, plus the motivation of the uh, black underclass who is finally living in the conditions of uh, urban labor that are creating now finally self-conscious black – political expression powered mm-hmm. by working class gains is pushing for their uh, equalization within the citizenry that they have been denied since the end of the Civil War. And so that that real grassroots political movement reaches up to this liberal white uh, political project and creates this new modus vivendi for the Democratic Party, a new reason for the Democratic Party to exist. But and that, but the reason that this is now the new focus is because there can no longer be effective challenge on real questions of capital. We are in the Cold War. Communism is off the table. Socialism is off the table. Right. A social democracy that could be extended in some of its particulars is still possible. And that becomes the project of the Democratic Party. And that breaks up a lot of its support base at the bottom because these questions were not why a lot of Southern whites, for example, were Democrats mm-hmm. uh, and it undermined their commitment to the Democratic Party because 
they no longer associated the party with their class position because it couldn't anymore. Uh, and that reality then hits the crisis of the 1970s. And once, once supply shocks start hitting the system, once energy, for example, gets repriced in the global market, and once all those countries that we blew up after World War II and then spent the, the, next, the last 20 years rebuilding are now creating their own independent industrial economies that need to be serviced, there is this pull away from super profits at the center. The rate of profit begins to fall, and a real crisis now hits the system. But this time, unlike in 1930s, the working class has been turned into consumers uh, and uh, are now looking at politics through the lens of their identity as consumers. And they're voting based on their identity as consumers. So that means when the crisis comes, the, the, the real questions can not be asked because mm -hmm. no one is there to ask them. Both parties are dominated by questions of spiritual malaise uh, and government regulation and not the need to socialize the economy because that engine within the, so the political process has been disengaged. And there, there is also, I, I think, you know, crucial to this is, is that long term dedicated ideological project of conservatism to absorb the people being cast off by yes. the, the Democratic coalition as it loses you know, as the air is slowly let out of that yeah. hot air balloon. It starts to break up. Uh, it breaks up in orbit, basically, uh, once it no longer has material uh, justification. Because that, you had this this unwieldy that coalition that disagreed on a lot of cultural questions mm -hmm. and a lot of religious questions and important stuff, but agreed on a deeper level on a material project. Right. Post-1980, there is no more material project. So the only thing to vote on, the only thing that either party can bring up is uh, questions of identity. Very similar to how after the Civil War, you had this uh, cycle of recessions and depressions presided over by two parties that could only talk about the tariff. Yes. And, could, and, and couldn't talk about the gold standard, took the gold standard for granted. Uh, you have the same situation post-1980. No one can speak of the real cause of everyone's distress, so it has to be given. It, no, even though some of it is coming from a cultural point, like some of the distress within the culture is absolutely just purely cultural. Right. But that becomes the only distress that can be recognized. And so all distress gets filtered through that lens. And that's the politics that we have now dominating. Uh, and what is now happening and is accelerating is that the process that first dissolved the working class after started dissolving the working class after World War II, the new consumer identity is now coming for the middle and it's coming for the political class and it's even coming for the ruling class itself. All of these mm -hmm. uh, groups are, are being socially dissolved. They are losing any cohesion, any ability to, to coordinate action beyond their nearest, most selfish desires and wants. And that is the system we now operate under where we have these political parties dominating our elections. They're entirely peopled with entrepreneurs. Right. Because faith in the system has also leached out as time has passed. And so even though we still vote, we because there is some lingering belief that it means something, our actual day-to-day -day lives are such that we don't really have that faith and so when we operate politically, we operate selfishly because mm -hmm. it's the only thing that we can be sure we might get something out of. The tingle of like being part of a, of a culture war or if we are a member of Congress or a, 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 a regulator or anything, a job, maybe a promotion or to get famous. Uh, to enhance the personal brand. To enhance the brand, to be able to sell – uh, to sell MLM products to your Rube followers and to maybe get a uh, to maybe get a radio show. It's honestly the last vestige of free real estate mm -hmm. is, is the attention economy. Yes. Getting enough people to pay attention to you that you don't have to be subject to the wage relationship, which is what our uh, yeoman class has been running from throughout all of American history. And now finally, our politics are defined by the people for whom that fate has been delayed the longest because of free real estate 
are finally suffering it. And so the only refuge now is to get enough attention that you don't have to do work because that is slavery. It is the total lack of any sense of security or self-determination in life. And we're all staring that down. And so our politics are completely unguided. Like we're in a situation now where there is this package of legislation that is good for capital. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be incredibly good. It would be so good for capital, for all that stuff to pass and more. It would stabilize the American economy. It would uh, increase profits, but it would also offend the very most narrowly conceived self-interest of all the actors within the political system. That means all the funders Mm -hmm. and all of the elected officials and all of their staff and the lobbyists, everyone is operating off of the most near-term, short-term thinking because we are in a terminal decline of American capitalism. Uh, And so our ruling class is as atomized as our voters are. And so they can only give money to the people who soothe their most narrow interest. They cannot collaborate. They're in the same situation as that emerging ruling class was after the Civil War, when there are no structures that can facilitate their cooperation. Now we're at the other end of that cycle when the, the structures have dissolved and mm-hmm. broken, and we return to a state of, of disaggregated and hyper-competitive capital. And then a bunch of people all through the political system who are just there to get a substack. <laughs> and this is all being presided over by a figure, Biden, who is the corpse of the Democratic Party. He is the remaining structure of the thing that, at crucial moments, pushed America's politics in one direction or another. You know, it was that party that helped capture the labor movement mobilization of the early 30s. It was that part of the part. It was that party that was able to snuff out the communist wing of the co- of the Democratic coalition after World War II. And now in, in, 19, in 2020, Joe Biden was able to re- embody the structure as a negation of Trump, mm-hmm. essentially. Trump, because he was the final figure of an American politician, unconnected to any institutions, any ideology, anything beyond his most narrow, most selfish interest, and therefore absolutely captivating to millions of Americans who view the world through that exact same lens and yes. view, and, and uh, view their values through that lens. And, you know, you're, you're talking about the consumerization of the, of the electorate here. It's why Trump makes a, his, his psychotically devoted following makes so much sense because you're, you're basically, you know, you're not pursuing a policy goal. You're not seeking any material uh, referendum. You're, you're seeking a, a mascot, an avatar, a, a brand representative. Yes. You're, sell, you're selecting the, the uh, Pepsi over the Coke. Yes. And it's the, the thing that, that resonates on that, that base cultural spiritual level of, for you know, the Republicans, for the, the base of, of, of domination, of victory, of winning. Yeah. That is, that is a powerful brand. It is, but it's a shitty brand at actually governing. Yes. And maintaining a, a stability of governing structures that capitalism depends on is actually very, very bad at that. <laughs> uh, and so that reverberates that recognition that, oh, Trump is bad for business, reverberates through all of society, through our media institutions, through our uh, capital institutions, but also then through our classes. So that's why you see this big turn in 2020 among educated suburbanites. Mm -hmm. towards the Democrats, because they see how destabilizing Trump is as a figure. You have to be ideologically committed to him. You have to be emotionally committed to him to not care about that. And as yet, that's still a minority view in this country, even among the electorate. Mm -hmm. So the Democrats in 2020 were going to nominate some attempt to negate Trump one way or the other. What would have negated Trump? Now, of course, Sanders represents a return to the pre-80 conception of the Democratic Party mm-hmm. as an actual vessel for working class ambitions. And that's how that's his solution to the problem of Trump, the problem of charisma. Um, but of course, that is threatening to the narrow self-interest of all the people who make up the Democratic Party, the media class, uh, and it's and the funders of those things. So he is the the party cannot really 
like Trump could not be defeated from within the Republican Party, but Bernie is an actual existential threat that cuts through the fog a little bit. Uh, and, and outside of that framework, if you're not an actual socialist who actually challenges Democratic uh, Party like existentially, none of the people within it are going to work together. Like the reason that Bernie won isn't because the – or Bernie lost isn't because the Democratic Party really cheated other than maybe in Iowa a little bit. It was that they just coordinated a bunch of people to independently drop out. Right. And that was not the party. That was the president making a phone call. You know, that was not the party structures the way that Truman being put on the ticket was. That's literally just a former president making some phone calls to some independent entrepreneurs. and He made deals to them. Uh, So that is not the case inside the tent of capitalism within the Democratic Party. Uh, So all the Democratic Party could do really is throw out a bunch of uh, options on what to do with Trump. And the problem is because the, the people who are most out to lunch are the people in charge, they thought that they just needed to do Obama again. Mm-hmm. They thought, well, Obama worked, so we'll do Obama again. The problem is, is that Obama was essentially a thesis of politics mm-hmm. and Trump's Trump was an antithesis. antithesis yes. Another Obama was anti-dialectical <laughs> at the yes. end of the day. That was the, the crime. And that is why none of those Next Obama's worked. They only excited a identitarian fraction right. of one part of the Democratic electorate. What those people who didn't care about that stuff wanted was to get Trump out of there. Mm-hmm. And so the party itself in the form of Joe Biden, the last backslapper, the last party hack, really, mm-hmm. he became the avatar for that. And he was able to just absorb all of these anti-Trump, but also anti-Bernie, a.k.a. Small C conservative and largely affluent voters, but it, they cannot. But the problem is, is that now they're looking at trying to reelect Biden and they're looking at Trump still enthroned as the Dem- Republican standard bearer because they just didn't acknowledge that they lost. They didn't <laughs> Which have is- to. A kind of genuine uh, innovation in American political it is. Hi- history. No, like the, the cycles of these things are, are are work in such a way that the in, on the right the insurgent energy is stop is stopped by a defeat, mm-hmm. and then in the aftermath of that defeat, the leading edge of the insurgency is sanded off. Mm-hmm. People are brought into the tent, and then you get another try. That's what right. happened with Mag- Goldwater and then Reagan. Here, uh, there was, the defeat is not recognized as a defeat. There is no sense of, ah, oh, well, we have to moderate something. <laughs> we have to change something if we yes. actually want power. There is no reality check. So he, he, is, not, he, is, not, he is still in charge. He, yeah. re, he refused to be negated. Uh, which, honestly, Chad. But now they have to replace him, and they have, they have nothing. Like, they want it to be Kamala Harris. I find that interesting when you look at these cycles of elections, as you were saying, and the the kind of, you know, as you're saying, the folding in of the bleeding edge of whatever the ba- the Republican base wants into something that's more generally palatable for everyone. If the edge refuses to be folded, I, I, there's part of me that 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 sees that as, you know, it could go two ways. Either either it, you double down and strengthen it, right? And I, I could very much see that happening given our our, you know, current situation and our past trajectories or you know the the uh excitement bleeds the the power bleeds it, it blunts itself as as it uh, tries to this edge this refusing to capitulate former president blunts itself on the, the continued reality that it has been defeated you know yes but the thing is is that the Repu- the the constitutional order is such that there is a disproportionate amount of political power mm-hmm. concentrated in the Republican Party, which means that they get to make reality as they want it. Right. They get to, at a certain point, fold it in, which they're in the process of trying to do. They're, they're looking to ensure that no matter what the outcome of the 2024 election is, Trump is inaugurated. And they will have the, the support of a base that is not – it is that is fully willing to – accept any extra constitutional efforts because they believe that the last election was fraudulent. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Democrats are really in a bind because they have to find someone who can win big enough that they can't cheat. And that Mm -hmm. is a possibility, but the democratic party as it exists, cannot deliver it. It's micro target 
segment identity politics base cannot be generalized. It's only advantage that the, the cultural advantage that the Repub- Democrats have, and it's the only one that they can use now. The only way to build an actual antithesis to Trump is celebrity. Mm-hmm. It is nonpartisan charisma. It is real movie star handsomeness and Q score and trust. Mm-hmm. It is I, it is celebrity, which was a huge part of the, uh, the Trump the success formula. Of Trump, yeah. In fact, it is the catalyzing element of the formula. Other things are part, important, but nothing is more important than celebrity. And the Democrats, because they think they're the serious guys, they won't do that. Instead, they're going to just try to find the right intersectional slice that will get everybody uh, – raging but that approach by definition is divisive it's based on micro targeting but yes. if you have to pick one person to represent a whole intersectional group of identities all the ones that aren't within it get alienated yes it by its own premise can't work but celebrity now we're talking celebrity plus the democratic party's most anodyne commitments to uh to open mindedness and to, and to niceness and to niceness that could still work, but it would have to be sold by somebody who does not look like their human skin is falling off of their bodies at all times, like Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg. And that is why I do think that if there is going to be a democratic answer to the Republican challenge in the near term, that's going to come in the form of a celebrity. Uh, a, a Matthew McConaughey type, uh, perhaps your your George Clooney, someone like that. Uh, Oprah, I still think hat is a is a good name to throw she's out. Got all, she's got a lot of juice, and of course that seems absurd. But it's, I'm sorry, it's not any more absurd. I mean, Trump broke the fucking seal. Yeah, you know, and and if you say this isn't true, I'm not saying that they will necessarily nominate somebody like McConaughey. I'm just saying I don't know who the hell they will be able to elect. Going forward, yeah. if things just keep getting worse and the Democratic Party continues to be incapable of delivering a material pledge of betterment of conditions, how they can do anything other than continue to represent one side of a culture war to imagine polit- to imagine uh, government as punishing an enemy. And if they're doing that, I'm sorry, their pitch on there just is not as culturally dazzling. If it comes down to people who are enjoying the show, Mm -hmm. if everybody else stops paying attention, which they are already doing, if everybody else who is just being hurt by this system and is not committed to a libidinal investment in political spectacle, they're just going to stop fucking voting. And the only people left will be the ones who are getting off on it. And And the libidinal energy of the Republican response to decline is vastly more entertaining. Well, I will say, Matt, that the electorate has been growing over the last uh, the, at the presidential level over the last few uh, cycles. So it doesn't seem like as many people are, are turning off. The trend isn't towards turning off. But I would I would say that I imagine that your response is the increased mediaization and spectacleization uh, of the process, that it is, a, in fact, a TV show that we all uh, it, exactly. it's an American idol that we all participate in. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that uh, people but in raw numbers, we're going to get fewer voters or anything mm-hmm. like that. When to say the people who are still paying attention, no matter where they are and the demographics pie, are doing so because they're getting off on it. Because there will be no other reason to. So right. that means you're going to have uh, poorer people involving in politics, but it's going to be as part of the show that they're watching. Right. Uh, the One of the most poignant and useful pieces of data I have encountered about the 2016 election was a, uh, a interview with a Trump precinct captain in o- Dayton, Ohio, a woman who worked at a cashier as a cashier at a Safeway on a military base mm-hmm. for like 15 years, who said that she'd never voted before because she didn't think she had a more an informed enough opinion to vote. She didn't care enough about politics mm-hmm. to do the work of watching some boring asshole give a speech. Mm-hmm. Then she says she saw Trump and all of a sudden she cared. And now Mm -hmm. politics is an enjoyable spectacle to her, not because it's actually going to 
it, it's not pitching to improve her material conditions, but because there's a fucking TV star on it now. Right. There is a celebrity that I have an emotional relationship with. He is a performer. An entertainer. An entertainer. And so there's going to be this great divide in America between the people who are just too busy struggling to give a shit about who's sitting in a White House that doesn't matter to them and those who are increasingly miserable but who are invested in seeing a – they're invested in consuming a spectacle of sadism against their enemy. So uh, I think I would call that, you know, (laughs) that is basically a, um, you know, 75 minute summary of everything that we've been going out here. But I I think that it is a nice focus on what we've been talking about uh, from the perspective of the development of the electorate over time and and, and what constituencies are being appealed to. Like that's that's basically the highlight. Because right now we do have this essentially geographically distributed culture war electorate. Two sides broadly defined by people who adhere to a urban, liberal, mass media culture and mm-hmm. set of values and symbols. And those who uh, represent a rural, with quotation marks, really suburban, white middle class, basically, cultural milieu fixed around uh, local concentrations of capital rather mm-hmm. than international finance capital. Uh, and – that is the that is where actual t- political conflict is happening, and because there is no third force, there is no effective working class. There is no working class structures that can change uh, the flow basically between these two parties that can affect the events. We are all basically at the total mercy of this conflict. We can't intervene with it because we are only operating in its wake. All the real, all the actions are being carried out by parties, uh, and also you know mass media institutions that are acting out of self interest, narrowly and broadly considered, mm-hmm. and uh, and that means all we can do is is watch it and then respond to it, and p- without a electoral representation that negates that, that that comes at these conflicts outside of the structures that the parties create, there can be no place for a genuine socialist electoral energy to be directed. And that means that people who want to vote are going to be voting, voting to involve themselves in the culture war. They're going to be voting. They're going to be volunteering for the culture war. That is going, that is going to be the act of participating in politics. You know, I think I saw something the other day that is the perfect representation of that. Matt, did you see that campaign ad from the oh, lady who's running for the governor of, I believe, Nevada. Nevada, yes. Nevada, uh, who uh, bills herself as basically like a, a Trump groupie, uh, like explicitly, like, you know, basically like I've, I've fo- you know, I followed Trump around enough until he took his picture with me. Uh, and then she says that her campaign platform is and she pulls out a gun she's wearing and shoots three bottles, one labeled mask mandates, one labeled critical race theory and Hell one yeah. labeled voter fraud. Yeah. It's just like, you know, com- yeah. completely meaningless si- signifiers. Well, you know, material meaning you could debate, but it is presented on the level of pure culture war. Yes. Uh, and, and this is this is why the Democrats need to wise it up. This is why the Mandarins at MSNBC and the opinion makers on the Facebook Facebook K hive groups have to fucking wisen up to the need to up the fucking spectacle here because right now the democratic version of that ad is a woman in a turtleneck talking about how our strength is a diversity Mm -hmm. and, and, and like holding a fucking cup of chamomile tea Mm -hmm. that can get you a slice of the electorate, but it's not, it can't compete. It cannot compete with, with the, the, the absolute uh, pedal to the metal uh, neural pleasure of rooting for dem- Republican spectacle. Well, that yes. means they got to call in the celebs. It's their only hope. And the thing is, is if Comrade McConaughey becomes president and presides over some fun, like a furthering of our continued crisis of capital that is only going to be dealt with through you know, techno fascism, all of the worst horrors that uh, people imagine now occurring under a future fascist regime are going to be happening, but Mm -hmm. they're going to be happening under the 
race neutral, smiling, benevolent, vaguely new agey gaze Mm -hmm. of our handsome movie star president who's going to tell us, look, some things have to be done for the greater good, you know, but the rest of us just have to keep living and, and feeling positive. What did Jello Biafra say in California, Uber Alice, the uh, suede denim secret police? Yes, uh, it will come for your uncool niece. You will always wear the happy face, mellow out, or you will pay. It'll, it'll be the all right, all right, all right. Well, that is a pretty good place to stop. And, you know, we were talking about the response. Uh, you know, I had prepared a bunch of shit about, you know, uh, how messed up the elections of 1876 and 1800 were if we wanted to talk about, you know, um, fun little elections oddities. But I think that you, your global perspective is much more accurate here. But you've just talked about, you know, McConaughey being your prediction for the future of the parties from the top. But, you know, you've summed up the electorates from the bottom here and kind of talked about this this movement from producer to worker to consumer. But of course, there is always development. There is always a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. Mm -hmm. Where could you imagine the next categorization of the electorate going is there is there a position beyond consumer for for how people might think about this or organize themselves in relationship to these party structures right uh i think it would have to be humans mm-hmm. i don't want to get too like new age here but i feel like whatever if, if there is something that comes from the bottom to challenge this political consensus it is going to have to be generated First and foremost, by working class mobilization, it's going to come out of labor. I think that is 100 percent. That, that's the only path. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also going to then have cultural expressions and it's going to have uh, symbols and a language to communicate its values beyond the individual nodes of labor uh, mobilization. And that is going to. I think have to recognize the the existential state of uh, the moment, the 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 degree to which we are truly on the precipice of humanity being extinguished. And I don't mean that the world's going to end and we're all going to die, but that what it means to be a human mm-hmm. will be so radically changed that from our position we would not recognize them as human beings, as of containing the uh, elements of basic dignity and choice and autonomy of being and spirit mm-hmm. that would quantify that would qualify for a human being. Uh, and so I think we'll have to identify as as people and uh, create a a political agenda and language around human worth and dignity and defining finally redefining what that means away from uh, a collection of desires that the market then feeds, which is what we currently conceive ourselves as. I think that's the optimistic, the hope for a reorganization from the uh, bottom up. Uh, Here's my pessimistic prediction for for a top-down new form. Uh, No longer consumers, users. Mm. Uh, that your consu- your consumption is no longer uh, fully open on this this at least within this market that we've established, but it is now you're still consuming, but it is now mediated by just a few techno uh, like giants, uh, in which your the your basic interaction with the state, with the market, with reality is as the user of a few platforms. Yep, yeah. and instead uh, of a social contract, we have a user agreement. Yes, exactly. Which is uh, not collectively negotiated with mm-hmm. power, as we imagine a social contract, but individually negotiated from a position of t- a total disadvantage without any ability to to push any leverage in the negotiation. Exactly. And I think I think that that is what, uh, you know, some people might call like a form of, uh, I don't know, techno feudalism yeah. would be a word that you would hear put a, right. put around for that. But that seems to be the the negative evolution of the yes. consumer as the subject and you know at that point then voting is perhaps even just for electing which pl- head of which platform you might want to represent you are you more of an amazon guy or are you a facebook guy like right, which, yeah. which of these which of these prerogatives do you do you find more important in your user experience of yes. the world yes your feedback is very important to us yes 
you, you get to you get to rate review and subscribe oh uh, god potentially to to the country oh fuck well i i think that that is pretty good i you know that 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 took a technically we started talking about elections i think we ended up more talking about the electorate but uh you know that is the way in which we interact with this uh polis that we have you know uh, in, and our identity, not as citizens, but as uh, voters, as an electorate within it. Uh, and I think that's a pretty good place to stop. Uh, next week, we'll have our last episode of the series, yeah. which I think will be a little more just uh, fun stuff, some trivia, some some overall final thoughts about the presidents themselves, uh, a good collection of, um, I have some genealogical factoids that I have uh, to bring in uh, for, for this show. Um, but yeah. Anything, any final thoughts, Matt? No, you got, I think you got it. All right, great. Well, I'll leave it on. All right. All right. All right. Uh, see you next week for the final episode of Bye-bye. hell of presidents. Natural, you will draw for the